It was the day that changed America forever. Now a way to remember the tragedy of 9-11. We take you to today's dedication of a powerful new memorial. Fleeing the flames, wildfires cover Southern California. We have the latest in the fight to get them under control. An army private convicted of leaking secret information says he wants to become a woman. The new response from the Defense Department tonight. Plus, our Rome Bureau previews the Pope's trip to the Holy Land. Those stories and more on EWTN News Nightly for Thursday, May 15th, 2014. Good evening from Washington, D.C. I'm Brian Patrick. Thank you for joining us tonight. As we look at news now, with allegations of deadly delays and preventable deaths of veterans, the VA is in the hot seat tonight. Our Jason Calvi joins us from the Capitol with the latest on this ongoing story. Brian, Senators hammered the head of Veterans Affairs today. Will the secretary resign? Who's responsible for the problems and what's being done to fix them? Uh, do you believe uh, that you're ultimately responsible for all this? I am. Veterans Affairs Secretary Eric Shinseki is grilled today on Capitol Hill. Would you explain to me, after knowing all this information, why you should not resign? Well, I tell you, Senator, that uh, I came here to make things better for veterans. But Sally Barnes Breen says that didn't happen with her father, 71 year old Navy vet Thomas Breen. A VA doctor diagnosed him with bladder cancer in September. They promised to give Pop urgency within one week. The call didn't come in time. He died more than a month later. I said, well, you're a little too late. He's dead because of all of you. Former VA Dr. Samuel Foote is a whistleblower. He says staff kept a private list of patients to hide lengthy delays. If you died on that list, they could just cross your name off and there was no trace that you'd ever been to the Phoenix VA. But the Phoenix Hospital has strongly denied the existence of a secret list. And today, the VA secretary responded. Any allegation any adverse incident like this um, makes me as makes me mad as hell. The VA is investigating the allegations. The secretary says he hopes to have a report out in three weeks. Now the White House has appointed the deputy chief of staff to do his own investigation into this troubled department. Brian. Jason, thank you. And some of the other stories our EWTN News Nightly team has been covering in today's world, beginning tonight with the emotional de dedication of a New York City museum commemorating a fateful, unforgettable day in recent American history. Some displays are chilling and heartbreaking. Others tell the story of heroism on the day in 2011 that America was attacked by terrorists. President and Michelle Obama joined 9-11 survivors, first responders, and families of victims to dedicate the National September 11th Memorial Museum. On behalf of Michelle and myself and the American people, uh, it is honor for us to join in your memories, to recall and to reflect, but above all, to reaffirm the true spirit of 9-11, love, compassion, sacrifice, and to enshrine it forever in the heart of our nation. The museum extends 70 feet underground to the Twin Towers Foundations, and it honors the nearly 3,000 people killed in New York, Washington, and the Pennsylvania countryside by terrorists on that Tuesday morning in September. When you walk through this museum, what strikes you is how your emotions can feel sad at one moment, and in the very next moment, you feel utterly astonished and grateful at how people from all over the world responded. It was as if the entire world came knocking on our door, cried with us, and asked what they could do. Of the many heroes from that day, one young man stood out because of the red bandana he carried with him from his boyhood. 24-year-old Wells Crowther worked on the 104th floor of the South Tower. He worked in finance, but he had also been a volunteer firefighter. And after the planes hit, he put on that bandana and spent his final moments saving others. Wells believed that we are all connected as one human family, that we are here to look out for and to care for one another. 
This is life's most precious meaning. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Difficult memories, but we cannot forget. The museum opens to the public next Wednesday, May 21st. Now to those raging wildfires causing chaos in Southern California. Tens of thousands of Californians have been told to evacuate. Firefighters are working night and day trying to get the wildfires under control. But with temperatures near 100 degrees combined with their already heavy gear, it is very difficult for these fire crews. Then there's the issue of embers reigniting fires that had just been put out. Work, water, work. That's what I was thinking. You put it out and then it's, it comes right back because the wind was so, so strong. These fires fanned by hot, dry Santa Ana winds that blow in from the desert have burned through more than 9,000 acres in Southern California. More murder charges tonight for a former New England Patriots player. Aaron Hernandez is already facing charges in a murder last year. Well, today, prosecutors announced they would file new charges in the deaths of two other people. The shootings happened in 2012 after a nightclub encounter. Lawyers for Hernandez have not returned calls about the new charges. The U.S. military is trying to transfer Private Chelsea Manning, previously known as Bradley Manning, from a military prison to a civilian prison. The former intelligence analyst was convicted of sending classified documents to the website WikiLeaks. Now he wants treatment for a gender identity condition. But Manning's lawyer says a transfer could risk his client's safety. Our Wyatt Goolsby is at the Pentagon with details. Brian, according to two Pentagon officials who spoke anonymously, Defense Secretary Chuck Hagel says that he has given his approval to the Army to transfer Private Manning to a federal prison. Why? Because Manning has requested hormone therapy, which he cannot get at a military prison or any other facility run by the Department of Defense. Right now, Manning is serving a 35-year prison sentence in Kansas for sending over 700,000 classified documents to WikiLeaks. Manning was diagnosed by doctors with gender dysphoria, a sense of being a woman in a man's body. After his sentencing in August, Manning announced his desire to live as a woman and legally changed his name to Chelsea. Transgender people are not allowed to serve in the military, and defense officials have argued it does not have the medical expertise to provide treatment for gender dysphoria. Civilian federal prisons have, though, which is why officials say the transfer has been approved. Manning's lawyers, however, say the federal prison system cannot assure Manning's safety and security in the same way as a military prison. Defense officials say that this week, members of the Army will meet with the Justice Department to talk more about this issue. In the meantime, officials at the Pentagon have not released any official statement about any potential transfer. Brian? All right, thank you, Wyatt, from the Pentagon. Staying with the prison system now, there's news tonight about the legal challenge from Associated Press and four other media outlets. They want to know what drugs are being used in Missouri's execution. Today, they filed a lawsuit to force the state's Department of Corrections to make that disclosure. This comes after a European drug maker cut off access to a drug normally used in executions, forcing states to find an alternative. Many states won't reveal the name and source of the replacement because drug makers and compounding pharmacies could get pressure from death penalty opponents. And new developments this evening on so-called same-sex marriage in Utah. Today, a federal appeals court put a lower court's ruling on hold. Because of today's temporary order, Idaho court clerks will not have to start issuing marriage licenses to homosexual couples. Well, it's a race against time to try to rescue the nearly 150 people still missing after the mine disaster in Turkey. Even as rescue efforts are underway, mourners are burying their dead. We know at least 282 people have died. Despite some issues in the past, the mine's most recent inspection did not turn up any significant problems. A new indictment this evening in the South Korean ferry disaster. Prosecutors have just filed homicide charges against the captain and three crew members. They could get the death penalty if convicted. Eleven other people have been hit with less serious charges in connection with the April 16th disaster. Nearly 300 people died when that ferry turned on its side, then sank. The violence is beginning to ease in the Ukrainian city of Slovyansk. Many parents had pulled their kids out of school, but a teacher says more and more students are now returning to class each day. 
Meanwhile, the country is gearing up for a presidential election. An official with the Election Commission says the vote will be legitimate despite the unrest in that country. U.S. leaders are ratcheting up their rhetoric about the situation in Nigeria. Today, a government official said freeing the kidnapped girls in Nigeria is one of the United States' top priorities. But at the same time, the U.S. can only give as much help as Nigeria will accept. Government will definitely change tactics and learn from experiences of uh, countries that, like uh, United States and other Western countries that have undergone this uh, uh, process before. And we will have a handle on it. Government has not ruled out the option of negotiating to ensure that the, our girls are returned to us safely. Today marks one month since the kidnapping of those teenage girls from a Nigerian school. Leaders in the fight against pornography gathered today at the National Press Club. They're gearing up for a summit this weekend that will bring together a national movement against exploitation that's closely linked to pornography. Scientists, doctors and media experts will present the latest research on the harms of pornography. Many people think it's just a moral or spiritual fight, but the reality is that we have science now to back it up. We need to start talking about this, especially because children are becoming addicted to this at ever younger ages. The Coalition to End Sexual Exploitation includes 145 organizations that believe pornography is dehumanizing. They say pornography violates human dignity and the right to be free from sexual exploitation. Tonight we'll hear from the insights or the insights of two of the conference speakers. Donnie Pauling was once a pornography producer. He's had a change of heart and adds unique insight into the dark world of porn. And Dr. Marianne Layden directs the sexual, sexual trauma and psychopathology program at the University of Pennsylvania. Thanks both for joining us. This is a very serious issue. Donnie, you spent years in that very dark world. How can you witness to the exploitation of children, women, in the pornography industry? Well, I, I was in it for nine years, and so basically um, I have first-hand knowledge. I was actually one of the people who did the exploiting, and that's really all that there is to it. Um, we'd bring them in. We'd tell them that this is, you know, a life that's going to uh, to give them what they want and and kind of lead them down a path. And over the course of time, you would, you would just see their souls die. You'd see the lights go out in their eyes, and that's the best way to describe it. You see these bright, sparkly individuals who all of a sudden are dull and lifeless. And Dr. Layden, from a psychological standpoint, how does this seen as exploitation? Well, the, from the psychological point of view, the perpetrators of sexual exploitation and sexual violence, whether it's at the extreme end, like sex trafficking and rape, or at the smaller end, which is like sexual callousness and sexual infidelity, those things are released by what are called sexual um, permission-giving beliefs, and pornography is really our best teacher of sexual permission-giving beliefs that says sexual violence is um, what we do, everybody's doing it, it doesn't hurt anybody, and so pornography is our best teacher to get the releasing of those kinds of behaviors in the society, and we right now have a crisis in the military, on our college campuses, and in the country of those kinds of pathological kinds of behaviors, and we're trying to, to deal with the spread of misinformation about sex and relationships that pornography does. We know that pornography is morally wrong, but yet it's pediatricians and doctors now who are coming out and, and talking like you are. Is that adding anything in terms of those who should be regulating this industry? Is that any, add any weight? We're hoping that they will see that there are dozens and dozens and dozens of studies research studies that show the, the negative impact. We don't know one research study that shows a positive impact of pornography, and there are many studies, and I've reviewed 80 of them, that show a negative impact um, across the board of this negative impact. So that the morality issue is one issue, the crime issue is one issue because it promotes prostitution and sex trafficking, the pathological issue is one issue because it involves rape and incest of children. So it's across the board that many people are coming together to say this causes problems. Donnie, how does a guy like you go from producing pornography 
to where you are today. I understand that you were just confirmed a Catholic at yeah, Easter Vigil. Yeah, and actually, it's uh, I'm I'm in class right now because I feel called to eventually enter the priesthood of all things. But what happened is over the course of four years, there was a missionary group that would come into our porn conventions, and instead of standing outside picketing and screaming and tell us telling us that we're going to hell, which would only increase our anger if they did so, they were inside. Uh, loving people. For example, they would do makeup for the porn stars who were wandering around the convention halls and they would tell them that you're beautiful, God loves you, nothing can change that, not even this. So over the course of four years they broke down this hatred I had and once that was gone I couldn't justify being in there anymore. So uh, we look forward to the, the forum this weekend. We'll be in prayer that it is a success and we thank both of you for the insight that you've added for us tonight. Thank you very much. Thanks. Well, the president wants renaissance of the nation's roads and bridges. He says if we don't invest in updates, it will mean America could lose businesses. President Obama is asking Congress to put more money into repairs for infrastructure. This is the uh, Tappan Zee Bridge crossing the Hudson River where he gave a speech today. Normally, it would have taken about five years to get this bridge replaced. But the president's put the project on the fast track, and he wants Congress to do the same with other infrastructure work. I don't want us to just rebuild one school. I want us to rebuild every school that needs help. I want us to most of all, most importantly, rebuild an economy where hard work is valued and responsibility is respected and rewarded and where opportunity is available not just to some, but to every single hard-working American. The president also pointed out in his speech that China and Europe outspend the United States on infrastructure repair and replacement. Well, people are starting to travel again, and experts predict more of us will take to the skies than during any summer in six years. So if you're one of the about 2.3 million who plans to fly this summer, you better expect to pay more. Ticket prices tend to rise during peak travel times because of the higher demand. Coming up, new ambassadors arrive at the Holy See. We'll tell you what the Pope said in his address to the diplomats. Then a movie on some tough choices for people who want to be parents. That's all ahead on EWTN News Nightly. You're watching EWTN News Nightly for Thursday, May 15th. I'm Brian Patrick, and the Pope makes history again next week with his trip to the Holy Land. A rabbi and a Muslim leader will join him. That is the first time an official papal delegation has included members of other faiths. Our Alan Holdren joins us from Rome with more on that trip. Alan? In just over a week's time, Brian, Pope Francis will be traveling to the Holy Land. He'll be going there to commemorate the, a similar trip that Pope Paul VI took 50 years ago after the Second Vatican Council to open up the lanes of communication with the Orthodox. Now, uh, Pope Francis will be there for three days, just like Pope Paul VI was. He'll be dividing his time between Jordan, Palestine, and Israel. And I have 15 major events, major moments in which he visits with uh, Christians there, Jews, Muslims, civil leaders, uh, also refugees and uh, disabled children. Now, we'll see him following in the footsteps of his predecessors in every moment. He'll be going to the Wailing Wall where he'll be leaving a prayer. He'll also be going to the sites of uh, Jesus' birth, his baptism, and uh, his burial and, and resurrection. Now, uh, there's one particular moment that uh, Father Federico Lombardi, who was the Vatican spokesman, told us to look forward to in a briefing this morning. He said that at the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, the Pope will be sharing in prayer of the Our Father with the Orthodox Patriarch of today, who is Bartholomew I. And he said that this is something completely unprecedented, a public prayer of that type. Uh, that's something that anybody can follow in with uh, as they watch along on television from home. And that's something that will be there to bring you from the Holy Land. Brian? All right, thank you, Alan. We look forward to your coverage as our EWTN News Nightly team sets out for the Holy Land next week. Meanwhile, Christians in Jerusalem are expressing concerns just days before the Pope's pilgrimage to that holy city. This according to the Vatican News Agency in a letter to a Vatican representative in that region. These Christians say they want to greet the Pope and Patriarch Bartholomew, an Orthodox Christian, but they're worried that curfews imposed by Israel could make this difficult, if not impossible. The Latin Patriarch of Jerusalem, he's a Catholic, says he is joyfully waiting for Pope Francis to arrive. Um, tutti 
He loves everyone. He wants to help everyone. At this point, he is, in my opinion, the only valid voice in the world. At this point, he is the only leader that the whole world can listen to, be it Israelis, Muslims, or Christians. We hope that this visit gets the ball rolling that hearts convert in a way that we can finally celebrate Easter and everyone's resurrection. Patriarch Twal is Palestinian. He serves as the president for the Assembly of Catholic Ordinaries of the Holy Land. The Pope received seven new ambassadors to the Holy See today in the Vatican. They hail from all over the globe, representing Switzerland, Liberia, Ethiopia, Sudan, Jamaica, South Africa, and India, sort of a mini United Nations. The Holy Father focused his address to the diplomats on the challenges posed to peace by the arms trade and forced migration. Well, he's already played Zorro, and now he may be playing Pope Francis. According to media reports, Antonio Banderas could be cast as Pope Francis in an upcoming movie. Tao Due Films is making a Spanish-language film called Call Me Francesco, based on the best-selling book Francis, the People's Pope. A spokeswoman for the film company says Banderas is the top Spanish-speaking actor being considered for the Pope Francis role. Casting is still being finalized, but shooting is expected to begin this summer. Up next, there's a new documentary on surrogate parenting. We take a look at the ethical implications. And it's not exactly green acres, but some city folks are learning how to farm. That story is just minutes away. Good to have you with us for EWTN News Nightly. It's becoming more common. Celebrities, even everyday ordinary people, are using surrogate mothers to have children. A new documentary called Breeders is drawing attention to the complex impact that this practice has on women and families. Consideration within surrogacy is towards the adults and what they want and what they're looking for. This child's foundation of existence is a contract, an agreement, and more often than not, money. The babies were born two weeks premature. They were getting ready to walk out of the room and I said, please, can I please see him? Jennifer Law, producer of Breeders and president of the Center for Bioethics and Culture Network joining us now. Breeders, that's kind of a harsh word when it applies to human beings. Is that intentional? Absolutely. I mean, when you look at the stories of these women in the film that really were treated um, as a breeder, I was a nurse for 20 years. Many of the male nurses I used to work with always referred to us women as the breeders. That's really hard to hear, but it really does give you a better idea what this is about. The women you interviewed for the documentary, what did they say about surrogacy compared to what society says about it? Well, I think they said they thought they were going into it with, you know, pure motives. They were going to do something wonderful, benevolent, and help somebody, only to realize once they got into it how terribly difficult it was to carry a child to term and then surrender it and, you know, have no relationship with that child ever again. It's, it's quite completely complicated. completely unnatural, too, isn't it? Absolutely. I mean, we work so hard for mothers and babies to bond mm -hmm. in utero. And here we set up a situation where we say, don't get attached. Don't anybody get attached because this child is not going to be your own. And there's usually money involved here. Can you compare that to, like, adoption fees, or is that apples and oranges? No, I mean, the surrogate's being paid to produce a baby. I mean, it's literally, I would say, the buying and selling of a child. And if she does not surrender the child, if she does not produce that child, she doesn't get paid. Any suggestions or advice for people who find themselves working in the surrogacy industry? Well, I, I find it appalling how little focus is on the children. It's all about the adult desire, the adult who wants a child, the adult who has the money to buy a child, who has money to pay a, a low-income woman to gestate a baby for. We don't consider the children at all in these complex, um, new modern-day technologies. It's a tough issue to address, but certainly an important one. The producer of Breeders, Jennifer Lull, thanks for being with us. Thank you. Well, some news about a healthy trend tonight. Increasing numbers of young urban dwellers are trying to grow their own food and reshape city landscapes with gardening. It's part social movement, part economics, and all food. EWTN News Nightly Susie Pinto has the story. Food gardening in the U.S. has reached the highest level seen in a decade. About 42 million households are now growing food at home or in a community garden. So you just snap it off instead of pulling it. And when they're fresh, they're really crispy. And there's been a jump in millennials exercising their green thumbs, according to the National Gardening Association. Well, when we're interviewing for positions, my demographic and age group is all over 
the urban gardening scene and so interested in learning about growing things, willing to quit full-time jobs to come learn about how to garden. At the University of the District of Columbia, the contours of a youth food movement can be easily seen. Aspiring urban farmer Coy McKinney is drilling some local high school students on how to turn this neglected part of campus into a productive vegetable garden. You guys are actually doing the work, so you guys get a say in the design and what you guys want to do. The work outdoors marks a shift in McKinney's working life. He started out as a law student before he realized his passion for farming. The traditional way of how we've or how we think about work is, at least I feel like with my friends, we're not really down with the cubicle nine to five lifestyle. So we want to do, we want to have a more dynamic life. We want to, you know, be able to travel, visit, be outside, do lots of different things. And I feel like community garden and urban farming meets a lot of those needs for people. McKinney joins millions of others on a quest to improve their cities and neighborhoods with local fresh food. Susie Pinto, EWTN News Nightly. What a great story. From urban America gardening to down under, a group of Australian gardeners are measuring up for pumpkin season. Look at the massive pumpkins being cultivated in the state of Queensland. Growers are prepping for the Royal Brisbane Show's giant pumpkin contest. Some gardeners even put beeswax on the monster vegetables to get that extra shine. This year there's been a push to get younger participants. Some local students are really embracing the challenge. Actually all enjoyed growing the pumpkins. Some of us have been attached to some of the pumpkins, <laughs> like someone gets attached to an animal. Well, most of these massive pumpkins begin to rot before they even reach the judging stage. How sad. I was thinking of this giant pumpkin pie. I like pumpkin pie with whipped cream. Be sure to like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. Catch us again on EWTN's YouTube page. For all of us here at EWTN News Nightly, I'm Brian Patrick. Thank you for joining us tonight. See you tomorrow night. Good night and God bless you.